الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبا القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين لا سيما بقية الله روحي وأرواح العالمين لتراب مقدمه الفداء أما بعد respected scholars, elders, brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Inshallah for tonight's topic and it's very brief as we minimize the time as we get closer to Eid inshallah um, in portraying the lectures and portraying the thoughts of Ahl al-Bayt, the teachings of Ahl al-Bayt, I chose to talk tonight about a very important topic in reference to the holy month of Ramadan and in which we can grasp its essence and its most blessed rewards in the month of Ramadan in which is the faculty of dua the faculty of if we want to have another name for it salat because salat in itself is a root word which we can derive from a dua being made now inshallah tonight and tomorrow night we'll be discussing this and tonight we'll be discussing three main aspects the first in which we look at the holy quran in reference to zakaria what did he make dua for? What were the conditions in which he made his dua? And what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless him with? The second, we'd like to look at an example in history about a particular person and dua. And then we conclude tonight by looking at the concept in itself in a more depth. And inshallah, tomorrow we'll break it off by looking at dua in more detail. First and foremost, tomorrow we'll look at dua and what are the conditions of dua? Tomorrow we'll look at dua. And what are the main aspects in which dua is not accepted? What are the veils? What are the actions that we do that may veil dua? That's not even getting out of this particular room, let alone get, get going up towards the skies and being accepted. And especially in this particular month of worship, especially in this particular month in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showers his blessings on us. So it's very important to look at the pit holes in which some people may fall into when making dua the things that we may overlook when making dua and hopefully we can't we overlook these mistakes and try to fix them within ourselves i speak about myself first and foremost inshallah and therefore when concluding after these two nights we'll make sure to ourselves that when we do make dua we've already taken care of all the prerequisites and inshallah our du'as will be accepted. Now in saying that, please help me in starting the two-day topic of du'a with a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Ali ibn Abi Talib, alayhi afdal salati wa salam, is asked about du'a. And in instances we find ourselves in a loophole in which once we make du'a, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we're granted it straight away. Other times we make dua and dua and dua. However, we find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't provide that particular dua that we want. Now we're going to look at this more depth tomorrow inshallah. But Ali ibn Abi Talib has a beautiful statement. He says, when you make dua, when you ask from the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, make sure you keep knocking his door. Because... The more you knock, the more likely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open that door and allow you to come in or grant you that which you wish. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, from that hadith we can derive, and in other hadith, that we can derive that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves when his servant repetitively asks him, repetitively shows Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he is in need of him. He shows Allah that he is the one that he goes to when he is in need. He doesn't go to any Tom, Dick and Harry to ask. He asks first and foremost from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's very important when looking at the concept of dua. The concept of needing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now if we go amongst this particular room 
Every single person, no one can come forth and say, I have no problem whatsoever. They can't say, I have not one issue that I may need any assistance in. If we go amongst this room, you'll find to ourselves that each and every one of us, if we, if we were asked, what do we need assistance with? What do we need Allah for? What aspect of our lives do we need to make dua for Allah to accept? You'll find each and every individual in this room will have something different. Whether it be a financial problem that they face, whether it be a concept of marital status, whether it be a spouse, whether it be an offspring, you find to ourselves that there are some things that are very materialistic in this world. However, we find it under utmost perspective. We find that it has a, a large significance in our life. And it may be of a spiritual perspective in which we, we seek leanness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We seek guidance. So each and every individual throughout this room, we find ourselves that what? We need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to answer one of the prayers or the other. And it not, it's not only down to one particular aspect that we need from Allah. There's every single thing in our life we need from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we need to prostrate to Allah and make dua. And you've got to remember, inshallah, we're going more depth tomorrow. That if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this is a very important aspect that we'll elaborate on tomorrow. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't grant you that which you wish. It's not that... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't want to grant it. But Allah might have knowledge that that particular thing that you want may have a negative impact on you. As in there was one person, as the story goes, there was one person that was very rich. And he keeps doing dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah can you please guide me to your path. Oh Allah make sure that you make me steadfast on your path. And he begins to pray. Wa alaykum as wa rahmatullah. He begins to pray and pray and gain closeness towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and fast and give charity. And then he reached a state in which he was absolute poverty. From a state of rich, from a status in the community, from wealth beyond measure. He chose to gain closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah to him, he thought to himself, well, I've become religious and all of a sudden Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken everything away from me. He goes to a particular wise man. He goes to a man of wisdom and he says, look at what I've done. I've gone, I've tried to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah has taken away everything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken all my wealth, has taken all my business has left me with nothing. And the wise man said one thing. And the person began to think to himself. He says, how do you know that which Allah has taken away is not haram? How do you know these wealth that Allah has provided for you when you were in disbelief wasn't haram wealth? That thing when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to cleanse, wants to take away, in which we think of it as taking away and ridiculing us or taking away from us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may have a different image, may have a different knowledge than we do. And 100% he does. Maybe that wealth, he said to the man, he says, maybe that wealth wasn't halal source. It was haram and Allah wanted to cleanse you. The man begins to think to himself, well, maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had that idea. For me, the simple person, I think to myself at face value, this is wrong, this is right. But remember what we said about the story of Musa. Allah knows best. Allah knows this may be good for you. This may not be good for you. When Allah doesn't grant us that which we wish now. And he grants it in a couple of months time. I speak on my, my self perspective. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullah. On a personal perspective. I had one of my close friends. He applied for a job after university. For months on end. And there was one particular job that he loved. That he wanted to get and he put every effort to go in towards. And he made dua, he made nidr, he made everything. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave that job to a different person. Even though my best, one of my good friends was the more qualified person. And this person begins to think to himself, he says, well I've done everything, Allah hasn't provided. And, but he was a religious, he was a man of religion. He says, maybe Allah knows best. Two months after that he gets another job offer. Without even working hard, without even applying it was through a mutual friend and he got a particular job. He, he measured the jobs. He said, that job that I wanted, a lot of travel, I wouldn't have spent time with the family. It would have been very hard for me to wake up in those early mornings and come back. The time period was very hard. He said, the job I'm, I'm offered now after two months is a lot easier. The time is better. I'm closer to home. 
He says, I wanted this from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but Allah had a different plan for me. Allah knew he wanted to test me within these two months, in which when I get this particular job, he thinks and he knows that it will be best, ben, more beneficial for me. Therefore, don't think to ourselves, and we will elaborate on it tomorrow, inshallah. When we make dua, that Allah is not listening. Billah. Allah is listening. But there may be now on the first level sins. There may be actions that we've done, actions we've committed that veil this dua from going to Allah. And we'll, and we'll discuss it tomorrow. There may be actions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows better than us. And of course, He knows better. That we only have face value. And there's conditions in making dua. And the istijaba of dua. Inshallah we'll elaborate on it. But tonight I want to give you an example. And the example is from the Quran. Because it shows us in the Quran it does not matter how impossible a particular aspect is. It's very much very possible to the Lord of the creation. The person who Allah in which he created the cause and effect is not ruled by it. If we think to ourselves in Ibrahim's case. He says to Allah I want you to grant me. A successor that inherits me. Ibrahim, how old was he? He was in an old age. In which he says, my bones are beginning to wither. And my hair is beginning to become white. He says, Allah, can you grant me? And he says, my wife. He says to Allah, he says, my wife has reached an old age. And she's not able to give birth or even become pregnant. But he does not stop Ibrahim. He says, please, oh Allah, I pray to you. And you've never, re have you never rejected my prayers, my dua. You've never rejected them before. He says, therefore, I still pray, Allah. He says, oh Allah, will you not grant me this? For us, it's impossible nowadays. Can you imagine a 90-year-old, 90-plus-year-old having, having a child? In a normal perspective, Ibrahim shows us that there's nothing impossible for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he grants him. It's a beautiful story in the Quran in which we can learn from the door of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is never closed. It's the widest door you can enter from. There's a, there's a particular book written. A particular book which is a translation of the Holy Quran. If I'm not mistaken, it was Allama Tabrasi that wrote this particular Translation of the Holy Quran, but if we look at the backstory, how the Allama wrote this particular book, you'll begin to realize there's absolutely nothing that's impossible. Because there's one thing, look at the Quran, but there's other aspects in which you look at modern, say, societies and thinking to ourselves, wow, this story, because this story, when I read it, 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 it struck a chord within me. And I end on this, inshallah, within the time limit for tonight. This Allama, Back in his time, he didn't have the instruments, the medical expertise, but there was this particular, particular medical condition in which, and if anyone's seen Sherlock Holmes, they can look into this particular medical condition. And you find ourselves that the pulse, the heart pulse, reached such a stage in which it differentiates from the beat to beat that people may think that you are dead. However, the person's still alive. He's immobile, he can't move. But because the heartbeat is so lengthy between one heartbeat to the other, they think that the person is dead. They didn't have the equipment back then. They didn't have the medical expertise in which to say this person is alive or not or feel his pulse. Straight away they thought to themselves, you know what, this person's already dead. And the Allama's the narration says he wasn't in his essence in which he was able to speak or say anything or move. He was in a sort of a coma. So therefore they thought he was dead. They wrapped him up in a shroud, they washed him, they prayed janazah and they buried him. Look at this aspect. Imagine being buried six feet under. The sand on top of you, the dust on top of you. Six feet under the ground. And you wake up. Imagine. Because nowadays, remember brothers and sisters, we're all going to be six feet under when we, wait, when we wake up and be asked, what did you do in your life? We're going to be asked. Allama at the time, he was alive. He wakes up in that state. Now we think to ourselves, imagine the darkness, the lack of air in that hole. It's trying to struggle to go towards the surface. You can't because it's already compacted. Imagine that's death in itself. 
But Allah says to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's no one there anymore. There's no one that can assist him. Who can assist him? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he prays to Allah. He says, oh Allah, if you bring me out of this predicament, I make another that I will ensure that I write a translation of your holy book. Just get me out of this place. Subhanallah, and Allah works in mysterious ways. Back then, and up until now, there's many people that we know that dig up the graves and steal the coffins. Up until now. People dig up the graves and steal the coffins. At that time, Allah willed that that person digs up that grave. And he's digging and digging. And the alama says, if I make a sound, if I scream out that help me, he's going to stop, he's going to freak out, he's going to think there's someone dead talking to me from the grave and he's going to run away. So he says, I try to stay as still as I can. And he's digging and digging until he sees the coffin. So you can imagine that that grave digger after that particular moment never ever dug a grave again. Can you imagine he's up to the grave and he's about to take the shroud and a hand comes and grabs him. He's gone. But at the same time, what? The alama is free. The alama gets out of the grave and that's why he, when he's asked what inspired you, he says, that moment when I had no one except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I made my dua and I made my nidr and I made sure that I stuck to the word that I gave Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I end on this, brothers and sisters. It's just an analogy to give us the perspective that does not matter what kind of predicament you're in. Can you imagine being more of a predicament than, this, than the alama, six feet under, no one to assist, no one to aid him? Ibrahim didn't have a child in his old age. Never in your aspect have the condition that you say to yourself that Allah will not help me. Allah cannot do this. Allah just says to the thing, be and it be. He just has to say that. He has to think that. And if you reach that rank, Allah says, if you worship me like I have told you, I will allow you to say to the thing be and it will be. So imagine that perspective, brothers and sisters. And inshallah, we'll continue this tomorrow night in which we will delve into more detail of the conditions of dua. But on this perspective, inshallah, we pray to Allah that he accepts our dua. He removes the veils in which veil the blessings of the dua, the blessings of the barakat of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad.